Well, good afternoon. And um, before we start, I've just been told by Gide to my left here that he's very interested in uh, Charles Hollander's research as to the civil war in Nigeria. Um, perhaps that can be explored in questions later on. I'm so delighted to get a question like that for my former pupil master. For the first time in 20 years, the boot may just be on the other foot. Anyway, um, arbitration is viewed uh, by many as the ideal form of dispute resolution for businesses and uh, commercial enterprises because of its um, supposed speed and finality. And it may be thought particularly useful in the context of international and cross-border trade and investment as a means of de-risking one of the great uncertainties uh, of commercial enterprise, namely the reliability of the courts of the jurisdictions where one is conducting business. But what is the point of getting an arbitration award, one may ask rhetorically, if one cannot enforce it uh, relatively easily and predictably uh, in the country where the assets of the counterparty are located? And this session focuses on the issue of enforcement by comparing the attitudes of courts and regimes a, to the promotion of arbitration, and B, to the enforcement of awards. So this is a session with a comparative study, um, an exercise which will consider the approach, first of all, to enforcement and challenges to awards under the New York Convention, and uh, second, the approach of the English courts and of the Nigerian courts and of the courts of East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania in particular, and maybe also Rwanda, uh, but certainly those three uh, in particular. And we've got a uh, yet another star-studded panel for you today. Uh, first of all, Joe Box on my far left and Kyle Lawson on my far right, two more of our brilliant juniors in chambers whose practices have a particular focus on commercial litigation and arbitration. And then uh, closer in, the inside forwards, uh, our two very good friends uh, uh, practicing from African jurisdictions. First of all, on my right, immediate right, Aisha Abdallah, partner and head of litigation in uh, Anjawala and Kana, one of the leading law firms in Kenya. And on my uh, immediate left, Gide Ogundipe, a partner and co-founder of Sofunde Osakwe Ogundipe and Belgore, one of the leading firms in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, with a very flourishing and highly ranked dispute resolution practice. And GD, I should say, is also a director and past president of the Lagos Court of Arbitration. So he, at least on paper, knows what he's talking about. <laughs> now, the um, order of play will be as follows. We shall each um, speak for about 10 minutes um, we, with, I hope, room for questions, but I'm conscious of the uh, tea bell, which will ring, and we'll just see how we get on. Joe will lead off with a discussion on the enforcement of foreign wards, awards under the New York Convention, uh, focusing on grounds for challenge of uh, awards under that convention, uh, and in particular, the ground of a challenge on the grounds that it may be contrary to public policy, the more, most interesting uh, of the grounds of challenge. Kyle will then uh, take up the baton and consider the attitude of the English courts to arbitration awards and examine the options for challenge uh, of those awards and how friendly um, to arbitration the English courts are. And that theme will be picked up um, by Aisha in relation to the East African courts and by Gide in relation to the Nigerian courts. So there you will have a conspectus and the ability to make a comparison between the attitudes to enforcement of all those jurisdictions. But first, to set the scene and to lay down the terrain, can I invite Joe, either standing or sitting as you wish, to lead off with thoughts on the New York Convention? Thanks, Harry. Um, as Harry mentioned, I'm going to start by giving very much an overview of the New York Convention. Then those following me are going to look in a little bit more detail at some of the specific regimes and issues that arise. As you'll all be well aware, signatory states to the New York Convention promise both to recognise and to enforce arbitration awards. And this is one of the main reasons why arbitration is often preferable to litigation, 
because the chance of getting access to assets in other states is much higher. Whilst the New York Convention generally adopts a very pro-enforcement attitude, there are a limited number of grounds on which recognition or enforcement may be refused by national courts. These are all set out in Article 5 of the Convention. I've included these in my handout. I don't propose to read them out to you. The points to take from those exceptions to start with are firstly that there can be no review of the merits of the award. Once you've had the arbitration hearing, national courts can't reconsider the merits and reach their own conclusions. Secondly, the grounds included in Article 5 of the Convention are exhaustive, so it's not possible to argue on any ground other than the ones included in there. Third, and this is important to keep in mind, the burden of proof is on the party resisting enforcement, not the party seeking to do so. So if you want to enforce in a particular country, there's no burden on you to get to whatever the standard of proof may be in that state to show that the award should be enforced. Fourth, even if one of the grounds in Article 5 is established, the court still may choose to refuse enforcement. Article 5 specifically gives it discretion to do so. So taking into account all of those factors, it's unsurprising that refusals to enforce or to recognize are quite rare. A recent study of 850 reported enforcement decisions suggested that enforcement had been refused in only 70 of those. So the general premise is that the New York Convention is an extremely helpful instrument, and in most cases, that will suffice to ensure that once you have an award, you can enforce it wherever the assets may be. The main difficulty and cause of controversy has been, as Harry noted, the public policy exception. Under Article 5, a court may refuse to recognize or enforce where it would be contrary to public policy to do so. And the important question here, then, is what on earth do we mean by public policy? How is that generally interpreted? If we start with the English courts, there's been a general reluctance to refuse to enforce or to recognize an award on the grounds of public policy. For example, if one looks at the Court of Appeals decision in Westacre Investments and Jugo Import SPDR Holding Company, the Court of Appeal recognized that enforcing arbitration awards is itself a matter of public policy. That case involved a consultancy agreement to lobby for military contracts. Lobbying to obtain public contracts was not illegal under Swiss law, which was the governing law there. And the English court found that the case for applying the public exemption, public policy exemption rather, despite there being some evidence of corruption, was simply not strong enough. The exceptional case in this jurisdiction where the public policy exemption has been applied is the Soleimani and Soleimani decision. Now, the arbitration in that case involved a contract between a father and son to smuggle carpets out of Iran in breach of Iranian revenue laws and export controls. The father and son had agreed that their dispute would be submitted to the London Beth Din and therefore that Jewish law would be applied. As a matter of Jewish law, it is irrelevant that the purpose of the contract was illegal. The Beth Din therefore made the relevant arbitration award and the English High Court ordered that it be enforced. It was then appealed and the Court of Appeal overturned the decision. What the Court of Appeal said was that it had a separate interest in preserving the integrity of its process and ensuring that it wasn't abused and that in the circumstances of that case, it would uphold the public policy exception. Nonetheless, that's the only obvious case in England where the exception has applied. It's clear that it will only do so rarely. And at least when you're before the English courts, 
the general approach is very much one of enforcing arbitration awards. A similarly pro-enforcement approach has also been adopted by the US courts and a number of other countries, including, for example, Switzerland, Germany, France, India, and South Korea. The Hong Kong court recently pointed out, sensibly in my view, that it's important that the public policy exception isn't allowed to be abused. A losing party can't be allowed to frustrate or delay the winning party from getting at the assets once it's already been through the arbitration and been successful. Unfortunately, and perhaps unsurprisingly, not all jurisdictions have taken the same approach. And in some cases, there's been a much greater willingness to apply the public policy exception. For example, in Japan, the test that's generally been applied is one of public policy and good morals, whatever that might be. In Vietnam, it's been held that in order to enforce, the arbitration award must not be contrary to basic principles of Vietnamese law, rather than narrower concepts of just international public policy. And perhaps most concerningly, in China, the courts have looked at the social and public interest. Of course, looking at the Chinese approach when dealing with African issues is particularly important, given the levels of Chinese investment in Africa at the moment, and the likelihood that an African client may well need to try and enforce in China. The most concerning decision is the 1997 heavy metal case. That case involved an arbitration award requiring the respondent to pay compensatory damages to an American heavy metal rock band after its tour was cut short because its performances were banned by the Ministry of Culture. Now, the reason for the ban was, I quote, that the band had performed outrageous acts, including drinking, smoking, splashing water, lying on the stage floor whilst performing, and jumping down from the stage. Now, the Chinese court denied enforcement in that case on the grounds that performance of heavy metal was against national sentiments and therefore contrary to social and public interest. This is very much clearly at odds with the pro-enforcement approach that's been taken in the US and the UK and most other Western jurisdictions. And there's further reason for concern in this divergent approach. In the recent decision of the English High Court in Diag, Human and Czech Republic, which is the case that Kyle is going to address in some more detail, the key point was that an earlier decision of the Austrian court not to enforce was found to create an issue estoppel. What that meant was that because the Austrian court had decided not to enforce, the English court also refused to do so. Now, it will obviously be very concerning if a very broad application of the public policy exemption by a country such as Vietnam or China was then followed by courts in other jurisdictions around the world. We might question whether a UK, US, or Indian court, for example, would follow a decision where the test applied for public policy was very different to its usual approach. But there's clearly a risk there, and it's something that one should be very alert to when advising a client. The key takeaways to keep in mind regarding the New York Convention are firstly that it is very effective, and it's often a reason to prefer arbitration over litigation before a particular court. And that's a point to bear in mind not only when you come to have a dispute, but also, of course, when you're drafting a contract and deciding what sort of litigation, arbitration, or other dispute resolution clauses you want to include. Secondly, however, one has to note that there is a potential for argument about public policy. If you have a case that seems to have that sort of angle, be it any allegation of illegality or corruption, or perhaps a case involving public resources, 
it must be borne in mind that there is potential to not achieve enforcement in that case. And the parties have to be alert to the risks. In particular, I would advise, if you have this sort of case, thinking quite carefully about where to seek enforcement and in what order. If, for example, there are assets in the UK or the US or another jurisdiction that's generally quite pro-enforcement, and also assets in, say, China, it would be a good idea to perhaps go after the UK, US, or other assets first and get a decision enabling enforcement in those jurisdictions before seeking to enforce in other jurisdictions where it might be more difficult. I hope that that's a helpful sort of summary of the key issues. I'm now going to hand over to Kyle, who's going to look in a bit more detail at how the English courts have reacted to some of these sorts of claims. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Joe. Um, so we're now going to shift to look at the approach of the English courts, the enforcement. Uh, and it will come as no surprise to if not everyone in this room, at least 95% of you, uh, that the key legislation is the Arbitration Act 1996, which I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. Um, so I'm going to provide a brief overview of the key provisions uh, and then go on and look at a couple of recent developments on enforcement in, in England um, that hopefully should be of some interest. Um, the basic, the basic um, distinction drawn by the 1996 Act is between domestic arbitration awards and foreign or New York Convention arbitration awards. So awards made by a tribunal with a seat in England or uh, awards made by a tribunal elsewhere, which the parties then try and enforce in England. In terms of domestic awards, the Arbitration Act provides three really signature provisions. Section 67 allows a party to challenge an award uh, on the grounds that the tribunal lacked substantive jurisdiction. So one of the parties wasn't actually a party to an arbitration agreement or the tribunal wasn't properly constituted. Section 68 allows a challenge on the grounds that there was a serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings of the award. Essentially, something went wrong with the procedure. The arbitral tribunal just went off at a tangent. Uh, and finally, Section 69, an appeal on a point of law. That's still the most controversial uh, provision from an international perspective. It's slightly unusual. It doesn't feature in a lot of other international arbitration regimes. Um, and, and conflict slightly with the idea that obviously arbitration is meant to be a one-stop shop, final dispute resolution forum, if you can still appeal on certain grounds to the English court. In terms of foreign or New York Convention awards, the, the key provision is section 103 of the Arbitration Act. And basically that just incorporates the, the key provisions of the New York Convention that, that Joe mentioned. Uh, the English court can only refuse enforcement if one of the defences provided by the New York Convention is, is made out by the parties. Well, what does that really mean in practice? Well, the Arbitration Act is meant to be a pro-enforcement regime. England's still supposedly a, a pro-enforcement jurisdiction. If you have your award, the presumption is you should be able to take it here and enforce against assets. But it's actually quite difficult to tell because there's no uh, official statistics for the number of wars that are, that are made here, the number of awards people try and enforce, or, or the successful challenges to those awards. Uh, so to try and give it a bit of a flavour, I, I actually went through all of the cases from 2014 uh, in preparation for this, which doesn't take very long. Because, I mean, the figures are actually quite surprising. Uh, in terms of challenges under Section 67, so substantive jurisdiction, just one successful challenge last year in the English courts. Section 68, serious irregularity, just three successful challenges. Appeal on a point of law, six challenges. So still not a huge number especially if we assume there's probably a, a figure often used is about 1,500 war awards made in, in England every year. So only a fraction of these are ever successfully impugned before the English courts. Even those figures, uh, small though they are, can be unpacked a bit. Um, in, in fact, there's probably a bit of overlap in terms of the, uh, those figures because most parties take a bit of a blunderbuss approach if they're challenging an, an award. They, they'll challenge on a number of different grounds. So to say there's one successful challenge might just be the same case represented two or three times. Appeals obviously feature a bit, bit um, higher in the figures than, than other challenges, um, but that's not really representative because the number of cases uh, in which there's a successful appeal, the vast majority are all shipping in international trade cases. 
In some years in England, 100% of the successful appeals against an arbitration award are shipping cases. Uh, that's mainly because Section 69 allows you to an appeal against an award. Uh, it, it is not a mandatory, mandatory provision. And if you're doing LCIA arbitration, ICC arbitration, you almost automatically opt out of the right to appeal. It's the LMA, LMAA and the, the, the shipping-based arbitrations that tend to feature highly in the appeals. Finally, in terms of your foreign awards, so this is my one link to Africa. Um, if, if, if you have a, uh, an African dispute or, or an arbitration arising out of uh, one of the African regimes that you'll hear about in a minute, um, the successful challenges to those are, are just har hardly worth reporting. I think it's still the case. There's only a handful of successful challenges against the New York Convention Award that have, that have ever been made out in England. So that seems to present quite a rosy picture if you're a successful uh, uh, party to arbitration coming here to, to go for some great assets in the jurisdiction. Uh, although the tide might be about to change, uh, and I, I just want to highlight one decision uh, for you today, and that's the one Joe actually just touched on briefly at the end of, of her talk, which is Diag Human and the Czech Republic. It's one of the last decisions of Mr. Justice Eder before he retired from the bench and, and went back to arbitration. It's also the first decision in England where the enforcement of a foreign award has been resisted on the grounds of an issue estoppel. Uh, the facts of, of this case, actually, is, it's, a, it's a horribly bitter dispute that dates back over 20 years ago when the, when the Minister of Health for the Czech Republic intervened in a, in a contract that Diag had with a, a, a joint venture party. Uh, causing it huge losses. Uh, eventually, some 20 years later, Diag obtained an arbitration award in the Czech Republic for some 300 million pounds or more. But its arbitration agreement was very unusual. It had a rev inbuilt review procedure. So essentially, once you constituted your tribunal and you got your award, you then had to reconstitute uh, constitute another tribunal who would review the decision, the sort of internal appeal process. So that was very unusual. Um, for, to start with, and almost inevitably was a complete disaster. Um, so that's the first bit of advice, don't, don't go for that. Um, there, there's, a, there's a dispute between the parties, basically, uh, as to whether or not that procedure had been validly initiated, had it run its course, had there been a successful review, had it taken place at all. So a big dispute as to whether or not their initial award was actually final and binding, whether or not it could be enforced. Uh, Diag's solution to this was just to press on anyway and try and enforce in a number of jurisdictions against Czech assets. It had proceedings in France, it had proceedings in Luxembourg, uh, the United States, and Austria. Uh, it eventually ran into a bit of a problem in Austria when, the, uh, as Joe briefly uh, mentioned, the, the Austrian Supreme Court decided, well, the award's not final and binding. It's in the process of being reviewed. You can't enforce here. So they thought, well, okay, well, that's, that's not great. We'll, we'll push on anyway. And they eventually turned up in London, obviously, after the remaining assets here. And the Czech Republic said, well, you've already got an enforcement decision in, in Austria, but they've said it's not final and binding. On, on conventional English principles, there's an issue estoppel there. The same parties were in the proceedings there, same issues. It, it was on the merits, they said. Um, that issue of whether the award is final and binding has been decided, and it should bind the parties. Uh, and Mr. Justice Cedar was persuaded by that submission. He said, well, you know, that, that's it. The, the parties have already litigated this issue, and I'm bound by that result. Uh, he then went on anyway and said, well, I'm, I'm also persuaded on the facts that this award isn't actually final and binding, therefore it's not enforceable. But his decision about the issue stop potentially has much uh, wider ranging consequences. Uh, and it's just a decision last year, so I think it, it's possibly something we might start to see a bit more of in the future. It has been heavily criticized, uh, particularly by Gary Bourne and his, his new tomb on arbitration. Uh, and some of the criticisms are, well, w w what the judge appears to have done is invented a, a, a new, or recognized rather, uh, a new ground on which you can uh, refuse to enforce an award. It's not one that's recognized in the New York Convention, not one that's recognized in the Arbitration Act, uh, which are all provisions that are meant to be construed narrowly, they're meant to be pro-enforcement, so that's quite unusual. The second big issue is that, of course, the New York Convention um, necessitates enforcement, necessi it, it contemplates enforcement in a number of different jurisdictions. It, it, you know, forum shopping is built into the regime. It, once you've got your award, you obviously want to go enforce in a number of different jurisdictions, depending on where the assets are. So if you could have an issue estoppel arising out of enforcement proceedings in the first jurisdiction, you try and enforce it. Potentially, it's a real spanner in the works of your, your whole um, ability to enforce your award. There has been no appeal against this decision, so it's something we're going to have to live with. 
In terms of practical advice going forward, I think there are three main things to consider. The first is, this potentially does really complicate the enforcement process. There's the question of what is the issue that was decided in proceedings elsewhere in the world is not straightforward. In this case, uh, th this was one of the points taken, and, and Ms. Justice just said, well, you know, the issue is, is this award binding? It's pretty straightforward. They've decided it's not binding, and that's, you know, that's good enough. But that, that won't always be the case, and there will also be fine distinctions uh, as to whether the issue that's being litigated in London is actually the same issue that was litigated elsewhere. The only, pr the only possible sort of exception to that is public policy. There was a decision in the Court of Appeal in 2012 in the also very long-running UCOS uh, capital and Russia dispute, um, where they said, well, the question of uh, is an award contrary to public policy uh, is inherently a question only for the English courts. Is it contrary to English public policy? So the fact that the German courts or the Luxembourg courts have said it's contrary to their public policy or it, or it isn't contrary to their public policy, that, that wouldn't give rise to an issue of stuff. That wouldn't be binding, because the, the English court will always have to determine its own policy. But apart from that limitation, it's not, it's not really clear what the other ones are. No doubt lots of expense uh, uh, and expert foreign evidence will be required to sort that out. The second issue to, or point to consider is what happens when you have, uh, as will often be the case, uh, enforcement in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, as it happened in this case, you know, DIA could have tried to enforce in about four jurisdictions before they got to, the, got to England. What happens if you have... Uh, a decision in the first jurisdiction saying the award is not enforceable, and your um, decision in the next jurisdiction saying, well, actually it is enforceable, what, what happens? Well, the result is probably the English court would, would say, well, first in time is, is the principle we'd, we'd apply. But that seems slightly unsatisfactory and, and a bit arbitrary. The last point is, is really one of, of litigation strategy. And as always, it's important to consider your strategy when you're, when you're thinking about you've got your sizable award, where are you going to enforce? But, but now, more important than ever, if you're an award creditor, it, it might actually be worth starting in proceedings in a jurisdiction where there aren't very many assets at all. Just if you can get, you know, ensure a friendly tribunal and a decision saying this award is enforceable, on you go. The English court may now rubber stamp that. It might be easier to enforce in England, secondly. If you're an award uh, debtor, then it may make sense to start proceedings proactively and have a, have a determination as to whether the award against you is enforceable. So there, there may be life in the Italian torpedo yet. Um, in terms of wrapping this up, it's, it's still very much the case, if you look at the statistics, that if, if you have an award, in England welcomes you with open arms and you can enforce here. Uh, but there is just a sense that there are a couple of decisions out there that leave things a bit uncertain for the future. Hmm. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> So from Joe, public policy is an unruly horse, and from Kyle, a position of uh, arbitration friendliness from the English courts is now being uh, uh, reviewed and query whether there's going to be a departure from that. Aisha, what is the uh, position, please, from the courts of East Africa? Tell us about that. Um, thank you. Um, today I'll be taking you uh, very quickly through an overview of the arbitration regimes in four countries, that's Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda. Um, and I'll try and pick up some of the key similarities and differences in the jurisdictions. So we'll go through the geographic scope and legal frameworks, um, look at New York Convention, grounds for refusal. We'll ch touch on public policy, which um, Joe mentioned. Uh, procedural requirements, finality, appeals, and talking points. And if I haven't covered any of that, we can still talk about it at the end. Um, so the legislative background is good. All, all four countries have a sound statutory framework that uh, allows for arbitration. And um, the only thing to mention is that the Tanzanian Act is the only one that is not an unsuitable model law and requires updating. It is very old. Um, it specifically carves out um, land disputes, um, and it's posing uh, practical issues at the moment because it, uh, it's silent on a number of issues. In terms of the New York Convention, all four countries are party to it, and the enforcement of international awards would apply under the uh, convention rules. They all have um, very similar grounds for refusal to enforce. Um, and they're the normal grounds. Um, public policy is obviously the, the, the interesting one in that it's quite wide. 
Um, in terms of Uganda, you've got a time limit. Um, and after that time limit, the set aside grounds are exactly the same as the grounds for refusal. So in effect, we have the same grounds across the board. In terms of public policy, at least in Kenya, this is uh, specifically a very wide interpretation of public policy. It is incapable of precise definition. Um, however, it does lean towards finality, and that means that uh, parties are required to accept their awards, warts and all. So if you like it or you don't like it, the courts are going to wash their hands off the affair as far as possible. We've had a recent case in Kenya about the enforcement of an inter international award. This took place in um, last year in 2014 in the Mombasa High Court. We had a, a contract for roadworks between a Kenyan company, Kundan Singh, and the Tanzanian National Roads Agency. Um, there was a dispute which was referred to the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. An award was made, a majority award, two to one in favor of the roads agency uh, on its counterclaim for damages. And then there was an application by Kundan Singh in uh, Sweden to appeal that award which was pending. What happened was um, the Tanzanian Roads Agency then followed the assets which were in Kenya. So they made an application in Mombasa High Court to recognize and enforce the judgment. At the same time, they made a, an application in Nairobi to set aside the award. Now the good news was that Nairobi High Court threw, threw out the um, attempt to set aside on the basis that we were not the primary jurisdiction. We didn't have the mandate to uh, set aside. And uh, then they went back to Mombasa and argued whether or not the judgment should be uh, recognized and enforced. And the main issue there was that the award on the counterclaim was based on English law rather than the law of the contract, which was Tanzanian law. So the Mombasa High Court judge said that as a matter of public policy in Kenya, um, he could not enforce the award because it failed to apply the mandatory contract law agreed between the parties, which was Tanzanian law. So there was a refusal to enforce. And then um, that was appealed to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and then there was a preliminary objection on jurisdiction because our Ar Arbitration Act doesn't actually allow, it doesn't, it's silent on whether or not you can appeal an international award. You can appeal a domestic award if there's a previous agreement to appeal on a point of law. So the Court of Appeal looked at the issue and said, because the um, model law is an uncertain one and because there's limited court intervention intended, there was no jurisdiction for it to reconsider the decision by the High Court, which stood, which meant that award was not enforceable in Kenya. It's quite controversial because of the reasoning on public policy. In terms of uh, procedural requirements, they're all quite similar. You do need the original or certified copy of the award and you may need a translation. Um, however, a failure on one of these procedural points in Kenya is not fatal because uh, we have a constitution that requires the courts to, um, to undertake a substantive justice and overlook procedural irregularity so you can rectify it. Also, a failure to apply to set aside does not mean that you can't challenge uh, recognition and enforcement. On finality, again, um, in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, the awards are final and binding. In Tanzania, foreign awards are binding. There's no um, provision on domestic awards, so it's not clear. In terms of appeals, there's a, in Kenya, you can't appeal an, an international award. There are no provisions at all in Tanzania, so it's not clear either way what the position is. In Uganda, it's very similar to Kenya. You can appeal uh, domestic awards by agreements on points of law. And in Rwanda, it says, um, again, uh, you can appeal on the same grounds as setting aside. So um, that would import the principle of public policy as well. We don't have any case law in Rwanda at the moment, so it's very difficult to see how these provisions are actually being applied in practice. In terms of finality and appeals, We've had the, um, we have a very wide definition of public policy in Kenya, and uh, it fluctuates over time, which means that even precedents are of limited value. 
um, and that it's it, it's also important wh whenever there's a, a court discretion as to grant granting of leave to appeal. Um, that issue is now settled after Kundan Singh. There is no right to appeal. In terms of um, so so in terms of finality in Kenya, you basically have your award whether it's. If it's international, you come to the high court and you take your chances in terms of recognition and enforcement. Whatever the high court says will stand. So if the high court says it can be enforced, then that's the end of the road. And if it says it can't, then you have to go to another jurisdiction where there's assets. So just um, to recap, public policy in Kenya is extremely wide. Uh, and is incapable of definition, which means I'll never be able to answer your questions as to what it means. Uh, finality, um, essentially this, this uh, in Kenya, the Court of Appeal has said that public policy leans towards finality. Finality comes at a cost which the parties to arbitrate must accept. It's their decision to arbitrate. It's a voluntary one and they give up a lot of options, including the right to appeal and that is considered fair. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm getting a pro-arbitration message from uh, the courts of at least Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Rwanda. Tanzania seems to be um, playing catch-up on arbitration law. Uh, let's turn west, and Gide, tell us what the position is, please, in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Harry. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm fortunate that um, I've had the opportunity of listening to the situation that uh, they have in, East, in, in, in a number of Eastern African countries. And I can say that the situation in Nigeria is very similar, um, with the exception, of course, of Tanzania, which needs its legislation to be updated. In Nigeria, we have two arbitration statutes that are presently in force. The reason we have two is because Nigeria is a federal republic, and some of the states take a different view to um, attitudes that exist at the federal level. The, we, we have a federal statute which um, came into being in 1988 as a, a decree promulgated by the military government. Upon Nigeria uh, adopting a new constitution in 1999, that legislation took effect as a federal statute. My own personal view is that it shouldn't have taken effect as, as a federal statute. It should have been um, legislation enacted, deemed to be enacted by a state legislature. Um, so we have the, the Federal Arbitration and Conciliation Act, and then we also have a, uh, the Lagos State Arbitration Law, which was passed by the Lagos State House of Assembly in 2009. And um, primary reason that, that, that we have two, two pieces of legislation in, 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 in effect is that there's a debate as to whether or not federal legislature has the power to legislate on arbitration. The view is that arbitration is simple contract, and contracts are within the um, residuary, well, they call it residuary list, it's not a list. It's not an exclusive legislative list, which, is, which are matters that can be only legislated upon by the federal legislature, and it's not in the um, concurrent list, which both can do. So it falls into the residuary, and it sh should be reserved for states. There's a question with regard to um, uh, international and interstate arbitration. The, there's, there's a view that the federal, gov the federal legislature can enact legislation on that, <coughs> which is probably the reason why the federal statute remains uh, <coughs> relevant. Um, and I say remains relevant because I live and work in Lagos State, so I'm partial to Lagos State. Um, the federal statute draws very heavily on the antitrust model law. Um, and the Lagos state law, for those of you who practice uh, in, in England, you'll be very familiar with it because the Lagos state law draws very heavily on the English um, Arbitration Act. My view is that the English Arbitration Act is, is the model law with the English being English and refusing to accept that they're drawn on the model law. Um, but then that's just me. Um, Nigerian courts are very pro-arbitration. Um, the tendency 
has been that um, they view, at least these days, they view arbitral decisions as being final and binding on the parties and attempts to have them set aside. The grounds are essentially the same as you have in, um, in, in the East African countries. Um, they, the, the courts tend to take the view that once you've decided on going to arbitration, you're stuck with it. If your decision is bad, that's your, is, that's your fault, and you have to live with it. Um, that's a change from what occurred maybe about 15 years ago when uh, high court judges viewed arbitration as something of a challenge to them. It was, it was something, of, something of a competition, and they would do things like try and set aside awards because they took a different view as to the, uh, the decision that was arrived at by the arbitrators. But over the last five, ten years, I mean, sorry, five, six years, courts have been very, very supportive of arbitration, and there's a whole raft of uh, decisions that have been handed down in the Court of Appeal supporting um, uh, arbitration. The one thing that I would say about, about enforcement in Nigeria is that under the Nigerian constitution, we have very, very liberal rules as to appeals. You can appeal final decisions of a high court on a ground of any ground of law. Now, those of you who litigate, you know it's very easy to formulate a ground of law. It might not be thought very highly of in the courts, but at least you can formulate it and take your case to, to the Court of Appeal. And the uh, appeal process in Nigeria is very, very slow. Um, presently, um, and from, from the Court of Appeal, you can appeal to the Supreme Court, again, on, on points of law. Presently, if you have, as I have, an appeal pending in the Supreme Court, it's been pending to, since 2004. I don't have a date when the Supreme Court is going to deal with it. So that gives you an idea of the sort of problems that we have in Nigeria. Um, um, that said, the, 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 the real problem, the real problem, as I said, is, is the, the time it takes to uh, deal with these things. In spite of that, arbitration continues to grow in, in Nigeria. It's flourishing. There's a lot of arbitration work going on in Nigeria. Um, and uh, Harry's been showing me signs telling me that, and I, and I promised him I wouldn't take more than eight minutes. Um, I've put something, it's in the handouts for you. Um, I won't take anything except just to, just, I, I wanted to mention the IPCO Nigeria case against NMPC because that was a decision handed down by an English high court in 2008. And the English court took a decision in respect of the enforcement of an award in Nigeria um, after the, the award had been handed down four years previously and then said four years for the enforcement was too long and English courts decided to intervene and take a decision. The point that I wanted to highlight was that the case in the high court in Nigeria continued for another six years after that. So um, it just, just re-emphasizes the challenge that we have in Nigeria, which is the appeal process. But beyond that, I'm happy. I'm still working. So, you know, it can't be all that bad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you. Well, well, the clock keeps moving. And um, you will find in your party bags a paper that I have written on OHADA, the harmonization project in Africa. We haven't got time for me to um, uh, present anything on that orally. You've heard quite enough from me today. Um, but we have got, I think, two minutes for questions. Uh, and then we shall have a break of just 20 minutes or 15 minutes, um, says Helen, for tea. So we're right back on track um, for 4 o'clock. So if there are any questions, uh, fire away, please. There's one at the back, I think. Could the panel comment on whether the emerging federal government of Somalia is um, within reach of these different jurisdictions? Um, it would fall within Eastern Africa. 
Uh, it's in the Horn of Africa. It's the, one of our neighbors to Kenya. Uh, there is no legal framework at the moment um, allowing the settlement of, of, of disputes with uh, Somalia in the sense that there is a government in place. It's under siege. And all meaningful operations, including government operations, normally take place in Nairobi. So I, I think uh, Somalia is a is a primary case for using um, the New York Convention, and then waiting to see what happens in that country in terms of recovery of assets. Thank you, uh, Nick. So it's Nick Ashcroft from Adel Shores. Uh, just a quick question: um, What impact, if any, do you think using some of the big international arbitration institutions such as the ICC, LCIA, MIAC, or the AAA has on the, the ability to enforce arbitral awards. GJ, do you want to take that? Well, I mean, from, from my perspective, I don't see it. It doesn't really make any difference. We have a number of ICC decisions that, are, that come to Nigeria for enforcement. The LCIA, the number of LCIA decisions as well that come to Nigeria for enforcement, it, it really makes no impact. The courts treat the, the awards as awards, and they don't really look at uh, whether there's some large institution involved in, in, in the delivering of that award. 